Welcome to the show where we study the continent, its leaders, the people, the trends, and the future. We get perspectives from the policy makers, the leading minds on the continent. We get your perspectives right here. I'm Julie Gishuru. This is the Africa Leadership Dialogues. This week on the Africa Leadership Dialogues, Charles Xavier Duval, the Vice Prime Minister of Mauritius, tells us about the country's strategic positioning as the gateway into Africa. You get to have your say too. And Africa's top 10 this week, it's young innovators, they're inspiring. Now this week we start with Charles Gaetan Xavier Luc Duval, the Vice Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Mauritius. Now he's an accountant by profession and was appointed Vice Prime Minister in July 2005. Previously he served in several different ministries including tourism, industry and industrial technology. Now over the past five years Mauritius has registered an average annual growth rate of 5.1 percent. The country is strategically positioning itself as the investment gateway into Africa. I spoke with Duval. This is what he had to say. Well, thank you so much for finding time to be with us. So there's a lot of optimism about Africa, but what's fascinating to me is that Mauritius is positioning itself uh, as a gateway into the continent. Tell us a little bit about that. Firstly, we share the optimism about Africa, but what we also say is a projected growth of 6% over the next few years is not going to be enough. Because when you factor in population growth, you, think, uh, you see that at the end of the day, you don't come to very much. So what we're saying to our, uh, uh, to, uh, our friends on the continent is that we have to up our game and we have to aim for much higher than 6%. And this is where we see that Mauritius can help. Now Mauritius has, over the last 20 years or so, developed a tremendous financial services industry, which has serviced a lot of the investments into Asia in the past, India particularly, but China and other countries. And now what we see is there's a lot of interest into investing into Africa. And really what we are trying to do now is to partner with other uh, of our friends, some of, the, of, of our friends in Africa, in, in developing double taxation agreements, uh, investment protection agreements, so that we can also start channeling the, in, the foreign investments into India. Because when you talk about development, you're talking above all about FDI. Because FDI brings you the capital, and FBI, FDI brings you techno the technology that you need for the development. And so, Putting FDI high on the agenda of Africa is very important. And channeling the investment into Africa. Let's talk a bit about the structure of the Mauritius uh, government and how it operates, because it's fascinating that you've been so strategic in your thinking. And I think a lot of governments struggle with, with being strategic because they're balancing so many different factors. How uh, have you been able to come to this position where you're so focused? I must say firstly that Mauritius has always adopted a very, a very pragmatic approach. You know, we're not so much bothered about ideology, etc. We tend to do what is best for our country, what is best for the region. And that has enabled us to take advantage of any opportunity that arises. For instance, we were a, a very good uh, producer of sugar, but when the possibility of, of textiles came along, with the uh, agreements that we had, duty-free, etc., going to, into Europe and the USA, we took advantage of that. We, we have beautiful beaches, so we took advantage of the possibility of tourism. And now ICT and BPO, we, we believe that we should actually be pragmatic and see what are the opportunities and take the opportunities. At the moment, we really believe that the whole continent, with Mauritius together, is going to be the future. And the next frontier, Africa is going to grow, and we believe that Mauritius can really help in, in, in uh, getting things along. But of course, we have also a lot to learn from the continent. And that is our point also. 
And this was because when you travel in the continent, you see how much, how many reforms have been done, how many countries are taking the lead, how many countries actually uh, experience very, very high growth rates. And w the main point that Mauritius tried to make uh, in this conference is that we, instead of trying to benchmark on countries, very hard to, uh, to, to actually reach Singapore, USA, etc. Let's try to benchmark on some of the great things that we are doing on the continent. Let's take, say, the top 20 best things that the countries and the continent are doing in terms of governance, in terms of economic freedom, in terms of ease of doing business, in terms of ICT, tourism, whatever. If we were able to list out the test best things, and then with the help of the IMF, with the help of donor institutions, etc., try and get the rest of the continent up to that level. For instance, we could benchmark uh, on Rwanda for some of the beautiful things that they're doing, on Kenya, on South Africa, and even Mauritius, we could, we could, and many other countries, and we could actually try and do that. We think that we need to be practical and pragmatic, again, pragmatic in our approach, and, and leave our geology by its side. Quite a few people are watching this saying, that's such an interesting approach. Um, just with that in mind, what do you think are the three greatest attributes of, of leaders? Um, where does it all start? What are the qualities they need to have? Honestly, I think it's the first thing that you need to have is patriotism. You really need to love the people because we are here, we need, we, it's, it's incredible the effect and the, uh, the power that a cabinet of ministers has, that a prime minister and a, and, and a president has. And he needs to govern and the cabinet needs to govern as an enlightened institution for the benefit of the people. I think that is important, is to, to bear that in mind. This, the second thing I think uh, that, that you need to, to, to do is, as I mentioned, leave ideology behind. And a leader needs to do what is best for the country, adopt best practices. I mean, today with the global village, with the information available everywhere, you can find out what the best things that people are doing and benchmark on that and, and, and take that, I think. And the third thing, I think, is to be a good communicator. Because if you don't communicate and if you cannot get everybody along onto the mission that you've actually determined, then you're not going to succeed. You need to be able to motivate your people. To create the buy-in. Exactly. That brings us to the people themselves. What do you need? What does a government need from the people when it's being innovative, it's, it's setting the pace, Mauritius right now creating a gateway? What do they need from the people? We are embarking on a 10-year economic and social transformation plan. It's, it's deliberately not just an economic transformation plan. It's a social also transformation plan. Because you cannot uh, uh, change a country without improving mindsets. Now, it's very interesting what people are doing, uh, saying about China. China, the wages were extremely low a few years ago. And in fact, people were coming from China to work in Mauritius. Nowadays, that's not possible because, because wages in China are overtaking wages in Mauritius. Why? Because people are attitude to work, attitude to pro productivity is paying off and they are enjoy, enjoying the benefits of that. So we need to change mindsets in Mauritius all over the region so that people actually have a, a different uh, view, uh, uh, way of looking at work, way of looking at productivity. That's one. So social transformation is very important. The way that we look at our environment often, you know, we don't give it the consideration that it needs. The way that we look at our own personal health. Are we going to go into wellness or health? Health uh, preve um, uh, Disease cure. prevention. Disease and, pre mm -hmm. So this, these are the issues that the population itself must take charge of, it, of, of itself and must, as you mentioned, buy into the mission of the government. So uh, that's very important, therefore, the, 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 the population must follow. It will follow when we have social marketing. That is, that is the government itself markets the social transformation that it needs by using the media, by using television, internet, and papers, etc. We are, uh, I'm a strong believer in social marketing. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. To take part in our weekly hangouts, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Twitter, at Africa LD.
positioning yourself as a gateway is also a very brave thing to do um, when it comes to a, a market that is perceived as risky. I'll use the word perceived. What is the greatest challenge that you face? In fact, the greatest challenge is also our greatest, um, uh, is what we can offer that is best for people. I, we see Mauritius as uh, a jurisdiction that will mitigate risks. Whenever you are investing overseas, you are increasing your risk in whichever region. And if you invest on the continent, it has business risks, of course, but it also has other types of risks, political risks, risks of stability, etc. So we see Mauritius with the rule of law, the democracy, the great communications, good education if you want to settle down, um, health, etc. It has also a vast range of professionals. So we see Mauritius as adding value to an investment into the continent by mitigating risk. And that is, uh, so, so this is how we position ourselves. Interesting nowadays. that your greatest challenge is the opportunity that you have, you have grabbed and are making use of. Um, Africa in 10 years, paint the picture for us. Africa in 10 years, um, I think what will happen is that growth can, can actually happen exponentially. You can see it, we saw it in Mauritius, we saw it in China. It actually, it catches on and becomes uh, something that goes very quickly if we give it the right momentum and the right uh, environment. Uh, what I see is that in Africa, there'll be a few role models developing. We can see already, without mentioning any names, some countries you know, taking the lead in terms of reform, in terms of economic development. Now, once these countries succeed, the rest of the population in Africa will not accept to live in poverty. They say, that country has done it, why can't, can't we do it? This government has done it, why can't you do it? And that is, I think, uh, the, the, will be this, the, the major factor in Africa, that we need to develop role models, leaders that will show the way, and people will start talking about what has, which country has done and what the other country has done, and the whole thing will, will go up. And, and once it starts developing, it will develop very fast. And this is why I am saying we mustn't stick on 6%. We must be much more ambitious, but we must also give us a means to okay. achieve our ambition. Finally, please look into the camera and give a message to the continent. I think that the continent, with the great uh, percentage of youth that we have, with people really being educated now, with people having the means, and the governments now adopting good governance and good economic governance, I think Africa is the future of the world, but we must all work together to make this happen so that our populations can enjoy prosperity, health, and well-being. Thank you so much. It's Thank been an much. absolute pleasure having Great you on the show. Mauritius Fact File. The Republic of Mauritius is an island nation off the southeast coast of Africa in the Indian Ocean. The capital city is Port Louis, and Mauritius covers an area of just over 2,000 square kilometers. The population stands at 1.2 million people and GDP at 9.7 billion US dollars. The currency of Mauritius is the Mauritian rupee. Since independence in 1968, the country has registered an average annual growth rate of between 5 and 6 percent. It has a middle income diversified economy with growing industrial, financial and tourist sectors. The literacy rate in Mauritius is just over 85 percent. Main languages spoken are Creole, Bhojpuri, and French. While English is an official language, it is not widely spoken. In terms of religion, Hinduism accounts for 48% of the population, Christians make up 32% of the population, and Muslims 17%. Very focused and strategic thinking. They're critical for the growth and development of Mauritius, but also presenting huge opportunities for the African continent as a whole. Well, we're going to take a break now, but still so much more coming up. Africa's top 10 this week, we're looking at young innovators. They are absolutely inspirational. Stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. part in our weekly hangouts, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Twitter, at Africa LD. 
stay with the Africa Leadership Dialogues. To take part in our weekly hangouts, go to our G Plus page, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Facebook, Africa Leadership Dialogues. On Twitter, at Africa LD. Interesting thoughts, wonderful perspectives, keep them coming in. You can participate anytime. It's really simple. Just go to any of our platforms and start getting into the conversation. Isaac Burns says, it's time for Africans to know what they want, stick to what they want, grab it and make a positive change for themselves. Africa and its people must accept that for the sake of prosperity, we cannot afford to be beggars all the time. It's time for the youth to make a change, a positive change through eradication of ignorance in any form. Newton Gatambia says, they need inspiration, belief and hope as a foundation for them to put up their building. They deserve trusting and funding too. I also think most do not get rewarded for their tireless efforts and few people realize their talents and gifting with plan to help. Time now for Africa's top 10. We're looking at young innovators, young people across the African continent who are able with whatever little they have around them in their environments to solve problems, to innovate, to invent in some instances. It's absolutely fascinating. Let's get straight into it. At number 10 is Uganda Noba Tokek, a former biochemistry engineer who has designed and built a solar-powered traffic light controller system composed of recycled materials. At number 9, Sam Kodo from Togo developed a humanoid robot when he was just 19. Three years on, he continues with his passion to create an autonomous robot capable of walking, serving and working. At 8 is Brew Coffee from Cote d'Ivoire. At 14, he invented an FM transmitter to broadcast football matches played in his neighborhood. At 17, he manufactured a walkie-talkie. And at 19, he manufactured a 15-kilometer range FM transmitter that was exhibited on a TV show dedicated to young inventors. At number 7, Arthur Zhang is a young expert in computer engineering from Cameroon who has developed a digital tablet called the CardioPad. This revolutionary device records data and sends it to specialists for diagnosis, a vital tool in areas where access to healthcare is an issue. Number 6, Sandrine Mubenga, a Congolese now based in the US. This electrical engineer transformed an electric car prototype into a hybrid car by integrating a fuel cell. She now specializes in the construction of power plants and is an inspirational example of what African women can achieve in industrial development. In fifth place is Joel Nwakairi, who designed and developed a biodiesel plant while at the University of Nigeria. He has already been recognized by the African Union, receiving an award under the Young Professionals in Science competition. At number four, Richard Turere. This 13-year-old Maasai boy who lives in the outskirts of Nairobi National Park in Kenya decided to address the human-wildlife conflict in the area by inventing an automated lighting system to keep the lions at bay at night using an old car battery, torch bulbs, and a small solar panel. He has been accepted at the prestigious Brookhouse School in Nairobi on a full scholarship. At number 3, 26-year-old Congolese inventor Veron Manku has developed a touchpad using a customized version of the Android open source operating system. This device is more affordable for the African market than its global competitors. At number two, Mubarak Muhammad Abdullahi, a Nigerian who at 24 years of age built a helicopter using pieces from old cars, motorbikes and scrap. His chopper is powered by a second-hand Honda Civic engine. The seats are from an old Toyota. They stem from the carcass of a Boeing 747 which crashed near Kano some years ago. The helicopter is 12 meters long, 5 meters wide and 7 meters high. It has flown 6 times, not exceeding an altitude of 2.13 meters. 
And at number one, William Kamkwamba. This young and talented African inventor was born in 1987 in Malawi in a village called Masitala, Kasungu district. At 14, he developed an electric windmill out of scrap. His dream that has since come true was to bring electricity and running water to his village. His story is told in the book, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, written by himself and journalist Bran Miller. Amazing young Africans, but we certainly recognize that the list is not limited to these 10. There are many, many young Africans doing amazing things at the grassroots level. You can share your thoughts with us. Tell us about a few of them. Maybe we can profile them right here on the show. Now, speaking of innovation, did you know that the world's first heart transplant was performed in Africa? Yes, let's be specific. It occurred in Cape Town, South Africa. That was way back in 1967. And another interesting fact, the CAT scan was invented by a person from Cape Town, South Africa. His name was Alan McLeod Cormack, and he won the Nobel Physics Prize in 1979. I love it. Interesting, interesting facts and all about innovation right here on the African continent. Let's close the show this week with a quote from Wangari Mathai, the late Nobel laureate and of course the founder of the Green Belt Movement. These are her words. It is important to nurture any ideas and initiatives that can make a difference for Africa. I'm Julie Gishuru. Have a nurturing week. <laughs>